you are going to have a field that's tens of a, you know, hundred of thousand times stronger than Earth's, Earth's magnet on all the time. So the magnet room, even though you, when people might not be working there, but magnet is always wrong. So just be aware when you, in the future, when you go to work in RCBI, don't think that because nobody there, so therefore magnet is off. Okay, it's not. Okay, and that strong magnet can essentially suck anything into the bore, and you have no way to take it out, and that's shut down the magnet. Okay, so that's that's only a safety part of MR, really. <laughs> okay, so. I mentioned we go into higher and higher field, and but just as a digression, recently people were thinking, do we really have to go to that high field? In fact, there was a publication by a group uh, from MGH and Harvard, uh, which proposed to do to work on a magnet that's portable, that has a magnet that can be holding one, can be lifted in one hand. And by electronic in the other hand, have a, with a total weight of 45 kilogram. Okay, and also it's very very low field and therefore low cost. And you can can have a material of less than 3,000. And the purpose is that this kind of ma magnet might not be able to answer all the sophisticated questions, but might be able to answer some of the simple but important questions. For example, in a stroke, mag management, where the stroke is really related with blood bleeding or blood clots. Okay, because two different kinds of uh, stroke will have very different treatment. Or you have a traumatic brain injury, whether you really have injury or not have injury. Okay. So some of those binary questions, you don't need to, to have very sophisticated MR machine to do that. And this is another direction people are thinking, of course, this is not the mainstream. Most people just try to get a higher and higher field and more and more expensive machine because they think they can do more. So this is a digression, anyway. Digression, okay. Um, okay, so we talk about the big magnet that allow us to do the, uh, to generate a signal polarize the signal that can potentially be detected. But as I mentioned, that, that process only takes a few seconds, and once it's there, nothing is going to happen. So MR signal detection actually rely on totally different principle, which says that you need to perturb the signal and then see how to return to an equitable state. Just like in that two energy diagram I drew, you need to for the spins go to high few, high energy state, then see how it relax into low energy state in order to detect signal. Equivalently, you, what you can think of in terms of uh, magnetization, then when magnetization is put into magnet, it's along the Z direction or static direction. But if you have a coil in a transverse direction, then if the spins the magnetization can be tilted from longitudinal direction to transverse the direction, then there, there will be the field line going through the coil itself. Okay. Well, here's another high school physics experiment. Has anybody done this before? When you have a, say, a, a loop of copper coils, you put a bar magnet in and out, then if there's a current meter, you can see the meter actually flip, right? Because when you have a change of magnetic field flux in the coil, they induce the current. And the current induced is proportional to how much of flux change are there. So you can imagine if you put somebody into the magnet, then you perturb their magnetization from this direction to x, y direction, and depend on how much signal are there and where it comes from, this flux, flux is different, therefore induced the current is different. And that different current give us detectable signal, right? So that's how MR signal is done. And so this is so-called a Faraday's law of induction. The signal will be detected with the magnetization through the cross-section of the coil chain with the time. Okay, so 
when this change is called. It, so since the core is all, usually, it's always laying in the transverse plane, only the transverse component of magnetization can be detected. Not the big one that's in the, along the static field direction, but the one that's flip into transverse, uh, transverse plane. Okay. So it is a transverse magnetization that's detected as a signal. Okay, so how to how do we bring the magnetization from this direction to XY direction? It's through this radio frequency frequency pulse. Okay. If you apply pulse, then you have magnet along this direction which is B0, but you also have a magnetization in the transverse plane. So the net and magnetic field is no longer along this direction but somewhere in between. And that magnet will cause magnetization to spiral down the transverse plane. So it's a combination of B0 and B1 cause this flipping of magnetization, right? Well, conceptually it's very easy, but you can see from the diagram that the spiral action is actually very complicated. But people must have experience with this um, merry-go-round, you know, like in uh, Ontario Beach Park, they have one there, okay? When kids stand on it and they go around and go around. So if a parent wants to, a parent want to take a picture with a kid of a kids on it, you know, better picture might be when the parents also stand on the, on the magnet, right? Otherwise, kids just move very fast. It's very hard to catch it, right? Similar thing here, you know, when we analyze the mass signal, if we stand with the spins, and then the motion of, of B zero signal, B zero field will be. Eliminate. All we see is B1 field, which is a very simple action. The magnetization just go from here to here. But if we consider both B0 and B1, just like we, you know, parents try to take a picture outside, you know, the, this merry-go-around, it's, it's a very complicated motion involved there. It's very difficult to do. So in MR physics, we call this rotating frame of reference. It effectively, just go with the rotation, right? And then you get a much simple, like a, a simple picture of uh, of the of the of the mo movement. So instead of uh, you know, if you're outside, you see magnetization going spiral around like this when you have both B1, B0 field and B1 field. But if you stand on the f on the frame of B0 field, all you see is magnetization going down. So in M all the MR textbook, when they talk about signal excitation and the detection, they're all talking about this rotating frame, even though some don't really mention it. Okay. Effectively, you, you ignore the, the, the action of, uh, of, the of the static magnetic field, and you just go in, you basically stand on a carousel, you, you get this observation of the signal. So in that frame, now we have magnetization, okay? When we have R pulse, B0, or B1, then magnetization will be, because now the magnetization is going to rotate around this B1 field, so magnetization will be rotating down, okay? In somewhere, in the, somewhere in the middle, then we will, we will have some component along the Z direction, some component along the XY direction, okay? This is in somewhere between the, when the when the magnetization is rotated down in the process. But if we look at it again, if we apply the RF pulse, a B1 pulse of certain magnitude, the magnetization began to rotate, right? So at one point it will be here, then another point will be here, another point will be here. Eventually, magnetization is going to be rotated to the transverse plane, and if we have coiled here then this magnetization is going to be detected as all C, right? Okay, so this transverse magnetization is our signal. And again here, the normal, normal relationship still applies. No matter it's B0 field or B1 field, it's a magnetic field, 
So therefore, this relation applies. OK. Except here, we, we have a B0 become B1. And we apply, the, apply this B1 for, for duration of time, for time delta t. OK. You can see from the diagram I just showed that depending on how large is the delta, the angle the magnetization rotate is proportional to that time. Right? So we, we, now we have this so-called tip angle or flip angle. This angle directly depending on B1 field also depends on how long the, the pulse is applied. Okay? So therefore, in my literature, you heard a lot about 90 degree pulse. You know, you use a spin echo pulse, which is 90, 180. What does it mean? It means a 90 degree pulse is a pulse that, that's applied to the magnetization so that effectively the magnetization will be flipped 90 degree from Z direction to transverse direction. So therefore, you get a maximum signal to detect. So that's a 90 degree pulse. Similarly, a 180 degree pulse just means that the magnetization is going to rotate 180 degrees. Okay. And that, what that typically is used for refocusing or inversion of magnetization. Uh, there's a lot of different pulse sequences use different uh, pulses. But essentially, when, they, when we talk about pulse or particular angle, like 90 degree or 180 degree, that means that effectively, the effect of it on the magnetization. Okay. So we talk about RF excitation and RF uh, receiving. Very often, receiving coil it's also the transmitting coil. It's only at one time it pump RF energy into the system. At the other time, it pick up signal from the system. So very often, receiver coil is also RF, RF also exciting coil. <laughs> and physically, this is a, what's called a bird cage coil. Essentially, it's like a bird cage. Okay, you have your head or you have a body inside it, and then the the different electrode will inject RF signal and also. We send electrodes, we pick up signal and send it to computers and to uh, the A to D com converter, change it into a digital signal and computer we process it. And coil itself is actually a, a field of science and art because a lot of consideration will put need to be put in the coil design and it's very essential to have a big, good coil designs. And today we really have a lot of different coils using for different purposes. Okay. The reason is that the coil need to be as close to the subject we are detecting as possible. So for example, for a head, we want a coil that's snugly, snugly fit with your head to get a maximum signal. If it's, if it's a coil just for hand, then you want to make it much smaller so that you'll be able to do it. And there are also different type of detection and exciting. <coughs> so there are very different type of coils. So that's our RF coil. Okay. And the third component of MR scanner is a gradient. As I mentioned already, so-called gradient is simply a a depend, uh, position dependent magnetic field. In this case, it's x gradient, which means that the, the, the strength of it is nearly proportional to x position. Okay, y gradient <laughs> is proportional to y direction, and z gradient is magnitude is proportional to z to z direction. Okay, and the physical D, again because a mod machine is, is this kind of a, a cylinder type of configuration, so you, you need to design the different electronics and different circuitry to allow you to generate gradients in different directions. Okay. And uh, typically, they put into layers and layers of coil, all 
around this uh, cylinder to make make the whole MR machine uh, consist of a static field, RF field, and a gradient field. Again, this is a diagram of um, what MR machine appears outside and what MR machine appears inside. Question about the the um, number of channels that are used when you're that, that go up like sort of the bird cage. Um, so you um, at the RCBI we have like a 32 channel, mm -hmm. right? And that's sort of the best that we have. Mm -hmm. And I know for the kids, for instance, they use eight channels because their heads are smaller, I think, usually. So mm -hmm. is it what exactly? So I think in the in the figures that you had a few slides back, you had the um, a description of this. And so what do those channels? Correspond to so are they like just more? Is it more um, that you're able to sample, or you have more spatial location, or you have more channels, so you're able to get more information in that bird cage? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's kind of all of the above. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, essentially, the there's multiple channel transmitting coil. Mm -hmm. There's multiple channel receiving coil. In RCBI, we only have multiple channel receiving coils. Okay. But essentially, what you can see is that just like um, in, in today's PC, you have a you know, dual core, quad core, you know, <coughs> the more core you have mean, means that the more parallel process you can do at the same time. And same concept applied to MR. Now, nowadays, people are pushing multiple channels because mm -hmm. With a multiple channel, you'll be able to either use the fact that you can acquire information at the same time to reduce the overall acquisition time, mm -hmm. or you can use that information to to give you more detailed information. Right. right. So, in general, more channels is good. Right. Okay. But of course, there are all kinds of problems as well. Maybe we'll talk about it afterwards. Right. So, um, so really, um, you know, I I talk in a very general term how signal is excited, how signal is detected, but exactly how this signal become image, okay? Um, really, I mentioned already that uh, the Nobel Prize work really is one about how to relate few gradients to the to the source of the signal. Okay. So in general terms that you you have a more frequency, you have not more frequency that's depend on the field. And now if a field is dependent on location, right? So then if if you can differentiate different frequency, that means you can differentiate different locations. Conceptually, it's very easy, right? Um, mathematically, even though I'm not supposed to talk about math, but <laughs> mathematically, there's a very powerful tool called a fast Fourier transform that allow us to go from one domain of information, like a frequency domain, into another domain, which is spatial domain and build this one-to-one -one correspondence. So the whole process of going from signal to image really rely on this fast Fourier transform. Okay. So I just stopped there, but there are lots of I'm not books talking about this. That's really the, the, the key to the MI image information. Okay. <clears throat> well, another thing I'm going to talk a little bit is about what so-called power sequence is. Because if you are going to do any MI experiment, the first thing you need to know is what sequence to use. What is power sequence? Okay. Power sequence is essentially a whole bunch of well-controlled events during MR signal excitation, evolution, <coughs> and acquisition. So behind it is a, it's a whole bunch of computer codes 
that control every point in the time. You know, this push button and must start acquisition study. Then what MR machines actually do is controlled by this power sequence. It controls RF pulse, it controls gradient pulse, it controls A to D con converter, you know, when the detector should be open, when, when signal should be sent from transmitter to the subject, when the signal should be feedback in the computer, all these things, and how signal should be amplified, and how much time should be delayed between each event depends on MR physics or depends on how spins are evolved. Uh, all these kinds of things are controlled by pulse sequence. Okay. And very often we need to repeat a whole bunch of time, time events in order to get a complete data acquisition. Okay. All these are controlled by pulse sequence, which in turn is really a whole bunch of uh, computer codes sitting in our MR machine. And we can change it if we know how to. Okay. And so a lot of development in MR field really is development of power sequence. So it, it should be on the same same page, but somehow. It, oh, okay, that's right. So, <coughs> so if you look at this as a time sequence, sequence really, the whole MR experiment or recipe for MR is, well, of course, first you need a subject. You need to put a, put them, put a subject into magnet, and hopefully they'll stay there and don't move, <laughs> right? Okay, just one thing. And then signal excitation begins, which means the transmitter radio, radio waves into the subject, and sometimes it's a few milliseconds, usually, okay? And then you, then you, you turn off the RF pulse and turn on the gradients. And gradients will modulate the signal that's excited and give it information, give it spatial information. So just like in the radio, radio transmission, you have a radio frequency signal that's modulated by the music or by the talk, by interview, by whatever. So the signal will carry information you want to carry through. Similar here, the gradient will allow you to have an excited signal to carry the spatial information you want to on this image, right? So you have that there, and then you receive a signal uh, remitted by the, by the subject, you, then you do signal detection, okay? And, and all this process, a lot of uh, details are involved there, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Then the measure signal will be, will be put in a, in a computer system, and then sometimes you have to re repeat everything again, and again. Okay, until you complete the data acquisition, then you process the data. Yes. Does this process happen several times a minute? Uh, depends. The the fastest process, this kind of repeat, can be happening every second. Okay. So you can you can have. Um, the quickest imaging we have now is uh, say formed in, in 20 milliseconds. Okay. So the, everything complete in 20 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. But there are also slower technique which may take a few minutes. Okay. And very often, for example, in the boat experiment, we're not looking at just one time point. We're looking at dynamics. We're, we're looking at how brain act, get activated with that stimulation. So we're repeating it not for this process, but for the process of spin of our brain dynamics. Okay. So I'm not going to go into much detail of this, but it, you know you will often see diagram like this, which is power sequence diagram, which tells you a lot about how the RF is applied at what time, how the gradients are applied along with the, at a different time point, how signal is detected, what's the you know duration of each process, that kind of thing. So this pulse sequence diagram. And at the end, if we look at a, a two-dimensional image, the data we get is something like this. Okay, this is so-called the K-space data. And if you play the magic of Fourier transform, then you get something like this. <laughs> right. So there are a lot of details in between I skip, but essentially, 
you get image in your, in your acquisition space or case space, and then you, you use the mathematical tool for fully fast, fully transform. Okay. So really talk about the key some concepts in MRI. I think normal equation and the Fourier transform is important. And there's another whole bunch of things I didn't mention at all. And hopefully you will either read or maybe I have a chance to come back to talk about it. It's imaging contrast and the contrast mechanism. Because really, just image is not useful, right? Imaging becomes useful until it tells us specific information we need to know. You know, the clinicians need to know whether that tumor is a solid tumor or it's a, it's a soft tumor or it's a, it's a blood bleeding or it's a blood clot. You know, neuro function, neuro, neuroscientists need to know whether that's related with the metabolic process of, uh, you know, it's really the, the, the neural firing or it's something else. So image is useful only when we understand what kind of information it really provides. That's through the contrast. And the, the contrast, there are a whole bunch of uh, process going on to manipulate power sequence so we can get an image of different contrast it, that in turn give us specific information we need to, need to get, right? Um, so there are many, many other things and the tons of books and uh, also previous years when RC, the BCS 513 is offered, we have actually had more physics coverage but um, there's, I think there's still some notes and the PPT on the PCS website. You're welcome to uh, look into. Um, why we want, why people like MI? Essentially, it's there are several things. MI, it's non-invasive. It's not like CT where you have a radiation-related damage to the to, to to the human tissues, which is really a concern nowadays, especially for kids. You know, CT scan. And it doesn't have that, but also it has very good contrast. It has three-dimensional information. It can also provide the functional and the physiological information. And in general, it's very safe. Okay, so there is just a whole bunch of images. I want to show you not only for, for human head, where you can do the 3D acquisition, but you can also form images of spinal cord and then in different orientations and that kind of thing and you can do image of a heart, okay? You can monitor the cardiac function. You can look at, in this case, a fetus in a mother's womb. Okay? You can look at the development of fetus, and then you can look at breast cancer, you know, have a mi based breast cancer detection tool, and then you can do the vascular images to get detailed maps of uh, your brain vasculature or the cardiac or the lung, okay? And also for this group of people, most interesting thing is to look at functional applications. And I mentioned the board already, but there's also a whole list of other functional techniques such as diffusion, which also include many, many different kind of uh, um, you know, different te technique development. There are also so-called arterial spin labeling technique, which allow you to to mapping the vasculature and the blood blood supply mapping in the brain, and also MR spectroscopy, which allow you to detect important metabolites in the brain metabolic processes. Okay, um, so there are many many things. So if you want to work in MR, then I'm sure you're not going to be bored because there are many <laughs> things you can learn. Okay, um, but for in one class, I can only cover so much. Uh, so to finish, maybe try to uh, show you a video, which which is interesting. I don't know how many of you actually watch TED talks from time to time. Uh, this is one. This is clip from one recent one which I think is very interesting. So let's watch first, and then. Something complicated comprises many small parts, all different, and each of them has its own precise role in the machinery. On the opposite, a complex system is made of many, many similar parts, 
and it is their interaction that produces a globally coherent behavior. Complex systems have many interacting parts which behave according to simple individual rules and this results in emergent properties. The behavior of the system as a whole cannot be predicted from the individual rules only. As Aristotle wrote, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. These are Scottish Terriers. In the beginning, the system is disorganized. Then comes a perturbation, milk. Every individual starts pushing in one direction. <laughs> <laughs> the pinwheel is an emergent property of the interactions between puppies whose only rule is to try and keep access to the milk and therefore to push in a random direction. <laughs> so it's all about finding the simple rules from which complexity emerges. I call this simplifying complexity. Unfortunately, the audio is, is very weak. I don't know how much you heard what he's talking about. But essentially, he was saying that the, there's a difference between the complicated system and the complex system. Okay, In complicated system, you have all the components working individually, and you put them together. They're still very random, very chaotic. But in, in the complex system, each component works individually, but when you put them together, they actually working together and they have a synergy and in interaction with each other so end up to be something much 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 sophisticated much powerful than individuals so when i watch this I, I was thinking about two things one thing is that you know in every course we talk about this talk about that well, it's all these simple components okay but if you just read and put them together really you can learn something but not a whole lot it's only when you try to make all these things together and then think about how they relate it to each other, whether they actually influence one another in a, in a particular way, and eventually you, you, you form a concept and form in, a knowledge that really works for you or work for the whatever technique you're working. So for example, the MR physics, I can talk about whole semester, or can, I can talk about one hour. I, I don't know how, what's the best way to do it. But eventually, it's up to you to decide, you know, how much you want to digest, how much you want to make it work for you, right? I, I think the brain as a system, it's even so, you have, you know, 10 to, I don't know, 20 or something of uh, uh, synapses and, you know, neurons and all that. And every one of them work put together and become a system and somehow brain can do all these amazing things not because you have this, this total, this, all this number of uh, different components, but it's, it's a way that's organized together. So a lot of study nowadays talking about, for example, use MR to mapping, to map the connections, map the, the relationship of, between different brain systems, between different, co different brain cortex and that kind of thing. So it is fascinating, but it's, it takes a lot of uh, integration to do all that. In, so um, that's kind of message I want to uh, give to you. And thank you very much. Any questions you might have? Otherwise, um, that's it. coming along with collected the data, but the data are very strange the way in which um, uh, Siemen says that so the, the frequency of the, uh, the uh, pulse sequence and the frequency of the, of the uh, uh, heart rate and the frequency of the breathing, mm -hmm. so that they collect at certain rates, but mm -hmm. then when you